Hello, my name is Derek from Tomcat Gas Training and welcome to this episode of Gas Safety Controls. And in this episode, we're going to be finishing off the controls for gas boilers and then we're going to be looking at things like these gas regulators. So, let's stop messing around and get on with it. Now, last few things I want to look at for boilers are, first of all, this. So this is what we call a zero governor gas valve. Now the, the multifunctional valve we looked at in part two, um, that was an atmospheric burner. So basically when the gas burns with that one, the gas is always trying to go up. And the gas valve is what sets the pressure going to the burner, okay? Slightly different for zero governors. Now, a lot of the new condensing boilers use zero governor gas valves, okay? So the way this one works is, the gas comes in here, okay? And what happens is, it's connected to the back of the fan. So combustion air is drawn in here and the fan pushes, and well, it kind of sucks the gas in and the air at the same time and blends it in this tube here and then burns it 360 degrees around this cup burner. There are also downward burners as well, um, but they kind of work on the same principle. So in this case, the faster the fan is going, the more gas is being drawn into the burner, the slower the fan is running, then the less gas is being burned. Now, inside this zero governor, there is a diaphragm with a very slack spring on it, but that is set for zero millibars, okay? So once the pressure goes lower than zero millibars, so on this outlet test point here, you would actually get a, a minus figure reading. This is our inlet test point, so that would give us, we don't want that going lower than 17 millibars, but this test point here would give us a, a zero reading. Okay, so when it goes lower than zero millibars, it opens and allows the gas in. Now you can see there are two solenoid valves here, and what the solenoid valves are there for is, this boiler has to go into a purge before it ignites to get rid of any unburnt gas from the heat exchanger. So these solenoid valves are there to close off the gas flow to the gas valve, to allow the fan to run and draw just fresh air in through these slots here which will then clear the combustion chamber of unburnt gas so we don't get explosive ignition okay so that's why the zero governor has um regulate uh, uh, solenoid valves on there okay now we can adjust these valves uh, to uh, to alter the uh, co co2 ratio but I covered this in loads of different videos on how to do it. Um, I've even done a full video on how to use an analyzer to actually do that. So I'm not gonna rattle on about how to change them, but my advice would be never, never adjust them unless it's your last option or whether you're installing a new gas valve or you're changing the gas. Watch the video on how to um, understand flue gas analyzers and the results, that'll show you. I'll leave one of them linky things at the top if I can work out how to do it. So that's a zero governor in a nutshell, okay? It's completely different to the multifunctional gas valve we looked at, but it's still bringing gas in, but it's not regulating it now, it's the speed of the fan, okay? So hope that uh, helps. Now the other control you can see here, on here, is your ignition flame rectification. But we've got two probes here now. Now, even some of these boilers still have a separate flame rectification, but it still has ignition. But this one uses the same, um, it looks like a spark plug. It it's, uh, has a HT lead going onto the ignition cable, but it still uses the same thing and it uses an earth cable here. So we have to have an earth because the ignition needs an earth to go to ground to make it work, okay? So again, this is sending the AC current, which then turns to DC, and the control uh, part of the PCB knows 
it's burnt 360 degrees around there. So that's a look at zero governor. Okay, remember they're called zero governors because there's zero pressure in there, it's all created from the speed of the fan, it's falling apart. Now let's see what controls a gas meter and um, an ECV. So let's have a look at those controls now. Let's start with the ECV, our emergency control valve. Now ECV, a couple of things. First of all, it's a gas control. Secondly, we have a handle. Okay. Now if this handle is missing and it's a non-emergency situation, then that would be categorised in the unsafe situations procedure item G11 as at risk. But if there was a smell of gas and there was no handle, that would be ID. Also, if it was inaccessible, same thing applies. Uh, Non-emergency at risk, emergency would be ID. Now, this handle cannot fall to on. Okay, but this one's falling to on. So you can see that's off, that's on, that's off. Okay, now this one does actually come with a little lock on there. So you could actually turn it off and lock it off and it wouldn't fall to on. Okay, so falling to on. Sometimes you can spin the handle around and it won't fall to on then. But you wouldn't be putting these in anyway, this would be cadence. So anything wrong with the ECV, then you must contact the uh, emergency service provider, which in our area is cadence. So that's the ECV. After the ECV, we have the anaconda. Okay. Now, the anaconda, a couple of things with the anaconda. It's not a control and it's not a safety device, but it links the ECV to the regulator. Now then, the incoming supply pressure here on a low pressure system is 75 millibars. Okay, but it could also be in a medium pressure up to 2 bar. So this little flexible pipe could be getting a lot of pressure in there. So we have to make sure we protect it if we're soldering near it. Okay, it's made of stainless steel, but flux will rot right the way through it very, very quickly. So we've got to make sure when we're soldering near a meter and we're near an anaconda, that we protect the anaconda from getting any kind of flux on there because it will rot through it quite quickly. Just remember there is up to, on a low pressure, up to 75 millibars coming in there. Medium pressure could up, up could be 75 mil to two bar. So just watch out for that. Now then, after the anaconda connected to that is the regulator. Now what the regulator does is what it says on the tin. It regulates the incoming gas supply to our working pressure at the meter of um, 21 millibars plus or minus two millibars. So that's 19 to 23 millibars. This is regulating the 70, in this case, the 75 millibars coming in. So it's an incredibly important part and in, uh, an important gas control. And again, if this has corrosion on it, and it, but it's not leaking gas, then it would be at risk in the unsafe situations. And if obviously it was leaking gas, then it would be ID. So let's have a closer look at this regulator. So this is what we call a constant pressure type regulator. Okay, so what we can see here is this part here is a seal. So I'm going to show you another one in a minute with this removed so I can go through how it works. So if we look at the label on here, it tells us, it gives us six meters cubed an hour. So this would go on a G4, U6, C6 uh, meter. Okay, wouldn't be able to go on a G10 or a U16. It gives us, uh, well, it's incoming pressure, 75 millibar, and it gives us our normal outlet pressure of 22 millibars. Okay, it also said there the metering pressure is equal to 21 millibars, so that's your working pressure. 21 millibars plus or minus the two millibars. 
So, it also says it's for second family gas. So this can only be used on natural gas, but there are some what say can be used on uh, first, second and third family gases. So if you don't know what the family gases are, first family gas is man-made gas, so that's coal gas. Second family gas is natural gas. And third family gas is LPG. Okay, so that's what the regulator label gives you. And again, if this was missing, this would be the responsibility of the ESP, the emergency service provider, to replace that. Now, there is an O-ring what goes on here, and every time you disconnect a gas meter now, you have to replace the O-ring. There's also one at the other end of the anaconda, which goes onto the ECV. Now, this little sticker you can see here is your label for the customer to tell them how to turn the ECV on or off. Okay, so that's a good close look at this label. Um, you should be really carrying this, this tape. So if this is missing, you would put that on. You wouldn't ring Caden out to put that tape on. Okay, so you should be carrying some of that tape. Okay, so let's see how this works. So this is the same regulator and I've taken the cap off. So you can see this screw here. So inside here is a diaphragm, there's a spring here. So if I undid this locking screw here and screwed this screw downwards, it would put pressure on the spring, which would put pressure on the diaphragm, which would increase the pressure Come in. Well, this is where the inlet comes in. This is where the outlet comes out. So it would give you a greater pressure on the outlet. Now, if I decrease this, so if I screwed it upwards, okay, so anti-clockwise. So if we're looking at this way, I'll be screwing it anti-clockwise. Then it would decrease the pressure coming out of here. Okay, but remember, we are not allowed to play around with this. Only ESP or somebody working for our ESP would be allowed to adjust this. So this would give us a standing pressure. So with all our appliances turned off, we would be looking for a standing pressure of between 19 and 29 millibars. You don't want any more than 29 millibars because it could blow your water out of a U-gauge because a U-gauge only goes up to 30 millibars. So what we say is up to 28 millibars, you know, you can see it's fine. But when you start getting over the 28 millibars, you need to start panicking. And again, you would get the emergency service provider out because there'd be something wrong with this. So that's the first test. So what's our standing pressure? Now, and again, our working pressure would be 21 millibars plus or minus two millibars. Okay, so you would put your appliances on and make sure that your working pressure at the test nipple of the gas meter would be between 19 and 23. Okay, if you've got low working pressure at the meter, that doesn't mean your pipe sizing is wrong, it means your regulator is wrong. Okay, incorrect pressures at your appliance, so you're allowed a one millibar drop from your meter to your appliance inlet test point, that would show you have got incorrect pipe size. So, that's a quick look at this regulator. Remember, it's a constant pressure regulator, and if you turn the screw down, it increases the pressure. You turn the screw up, it decreases the pressure. So, that's the regulator and a gas meter. Now, this is a slightly different regulator. This is what we call a medium pressure regulator. Okay, so you can see here, it says second family gases. It says it's maximum operating pressure, or it's MOP, it's 2 bar, and it's normal working pressure is 22 millibars. So this is a natural gas one, not an LPG one. And if we look at the side here, we've got this UPSO valve, which is an under pressure valve. So uh, LPG regulators have UPSO and UPSO, so over pressure shut off, which is in here, and under pressure, which is here. Okay, so that's a different regulator. So the incoming supply here would be 75 millibars to two bar. And then its outlet pressure here would be as normal on 
a normal low pressure system. So your working pressure, 21 millibars plus or minus two. Now, I might do a full video on tightness testing with um, uh, medium pressure. So that'll help you to understand that a little bit more. But that's the difference between the medium pressure and the low pressure is the medium pressure has this little upso valve which we need to use if the pressure drops resets the diaphragm and the uh, regulator so that's the medium pressure the last couple of things i want to look at now are thermistors and high limit stats now we're going to be looking at these little things here so there's one here and there's one at the top here on the heat exchanger on this boiler. So let's have a closer look at these thermistors and high limit stats and uh, finish off this series on controls. So overheat stats, well basically what overheat stats do is cut the temperature in the, if it was a combi boiler, to about 100 degrees on the main heat exchanger. So if they cut out the temperature on the hot water, they would be cutting them off about 70 degrees C and would reset them about 60 degrees C. But we're gonna look at overheat stats a bit later on. Now, thermistors. So these are all different types of thermistors. So they kind of do the same job as the old thermostat, but they work in a different way. So basically thermistors work by an electrical resistance using a very low current which is about 5 volts DC. So this current will be sent up one of the wires. So if we look at these, you can see there's two connections here. Okay, so this current will be sent up one of these wires and the th uh, to the thermistor. And then the current then passes through the thermistor and is sent back down to the other wire, down to the PCB. Then the PCB measures the return current coming back uh, compares it to the current going out and then depending on what this current is coming back to the PCB it will reduce or increase the gas output so unlike a new condensing boiler using the fan it would speed up the fan or slow the fan down so you can see we have what's called dry pocket and wet pocket so this is a wet pocket thermistor so this would actually come in contact with the water where this dry pocket thermistor um, would um, be actually strapped to a pipe. So this is the, the thermistor on the boiler we've just been looking at on this ideal logic. Now this does quite a lot of things. So the thermistor can also do other jobs, such as it can be a high limit stat. It can also be a frost stat. So if we was using this for a frost stat, it normally turns the pump on when the temperature within the boiler gets to five degree, uh, 10 degrees. Sorry. So if the water was 10 degrees in the boiler, it would actually just turn the pump on. But if the water within that boiler then dropped lower than five degrees, they normally turn on the um, burner and then turn it back off again when it gets to 15 degrees. Okay, so they actually, so that's how they do the built-in frost protection. Now, that's a quick look at these dry and wet pocket thermistors. Now let's have a look at actually how we're going to test these thermistors to see if they're actually working. The video I'm going to be using is another video I've stolen from a, another old one of my videos. I think it's from the Glowworm CXI video. So, uh, yeah, let's have a look at that now. As promised, I'm going to show you how to check this NTC, which is neg uh, NTC standing for negative temperature coefficient. Uh, so basically this is a thermistor. And what this does is it reads the temperature and sends a signal in homes back to the PCB. So that can tell the burner whether to, uh, or the fan to speed up or slow down to give more gas or not. So the way we check these, now today is it's about 30 degrees in this classroom. I've got my little thermometer here. So my little thermometer here, and it's reading just under 30 degrees. Okay. So we need a chart. So we've got our little chart here, which is gonna tell us what our home reading should be at a given temperature. Now, according to this, 
30 degrees we were looking at a resistance in homes of 9,786 or around about there. Okay, now because this is a negative temperature coefficient resistor, what it will do is, as the temperature gets hotter, the reading will come lower. So the colder the water is, the higher the reading, the hotter the water is, the lower the reading. So we need a multimeter, and you can see I've set my multimeter on to 20k. Okay, I'm just going to check and make sure it works, so the screen should change. Okay, so you can see the screen's changing, so we know this is working. So, I'm just going to take a reading now on what the temperature is here now. So, it doesn't matter which way around you're going, but I'm going to look up for these holes I'm trying to. It'd be handy if I had a pair of eyes. So, I've got a reading on my screen of 9.60. 9. So, it's 9.62. Okay. And according to my chart, for 30 degrees, 9.78. Okay, so it's not a million miles out. Now, what I'm going to do here is, I've got a cup of cold water, and this reading now is 19.6 in this cold water. 19.6. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take... The NTC, and I'm going to dip it in the water for a little bit, just so it gets the temperature of the water. And this should be a different reading. And if it's got a different reading, then it means this, the uh, NTC is working. Okay. So it's been in there a few seconds now. Let's bother about the water and let's take the new reading quickly before it starts to warm up again and we've got a reading of 11.82 and you can now see the reading on the screen is coming down because it's warming up so you can actually see this is working there is nothing wrong with this thermistor at all now, you shouldn't really test them while they're on the boiler, okay? But um, they're dead easy to take off the, the dry pocket. And the wet pocket one are exactly the same, except you have to get rid of the water out of the boiler first before you check them. Now, this is about one degree out from a wet pocket. So what the manufacturer gains in lack of sludge and affecting these, they gain in lasting longer um, while they're on the boiler. So that's how you check a negative temperature coefficient resistance resistor thermos, uh, thermistor. And you will need a chart and a multimeter and some way of checking the temperature to be able to do it. But if you do get a change in reading, then you know it's working. Now, this is a water heater. And I just want to finish off with these controls. So the control we can see here is in the waterways of the heat exchanger. And that's what we call the high limit stat. And if we go a bit further up, which is also linked to it, this is a vitiation sensing device. So what happens here is if the flue temperature gets too hot, it also knocks out. So this knows if the flue is blocked or not because the heat would be coming back through here. So these are, that's a vitiation device, but it's still a high limit. And this is a high limit stat. And what they do is, they knock off the pilot assembly, go into the burner. So let's just have a quick look at that to finish off. Now, this is the basic form of what we've just been looking at. This is an interrupted thermocouple. So what you've been seeing as we've been going along in these videos, this is your thermocouple and this is where it's connected to the thermoelectric with a slight addition. This is the high limit stat. So how this works is you can see thermocouple will create this millivolts, these, mil these 12 to 30 millivolts, which we keep going on about. 
that would then go up here around here and through the high limit stat now if the high limit stat is broken or the high limit stat is made from the heat it will stop that thermoelectric getting to this end okay so that would then knock out the thermoelectric which would then knock out the pilot flame so that's straightforward as it is so this is just a device for breaking those millivolts so how do we test it well we need one of our good old fateful multimeters and again I'm going to put it on continuity and what I'm going to do is I'm going to test between these two here and if I get a buzz which I do that means there is nothing wrong with this high limit stat and this thermoelectric if this interrupted thermocouple was installed in the water heater or in a boiler then it would work. So that is your interrupted thermocouple by use of a high limit stat. And this could be in the flue or it could be attached to the heat exchanger. And that is the end of this video. So if you've liked this video, why don't you give us that thumbs up because it lets me know you care or leave a constructive comment down below. If you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, why the hell not? Get subscribing because you won't uh, regret it. And don't forget to hit that notification bell because I release videos every Wednesday. As usual, all I've got left to say is, thanks for listening, thanks for watching. I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday. Cheers, guys.